We're in the desert of Arizona, but this place honestly feels like the Icelandic highlands. These perfectly symmetrical, like land before time style volcanoes, lava flows everywhere. It's like such an obviously volcanic landscape. It's fascinating. In the middle of the Arizona desert, a place we associate with Route 66 and the Grand Canyon, is an active volcanic field home to more than 600 volcanoes. These are capital V volcanoes. Like look at this summit crater, come on. Geologically, this is a place where volcanoes don't belong, but here they are. How did these volcanoes get here? How have they shaped and been shaped by the people living among them thousands of years ago and today? That's what I came here to find out, but I found so much more. I found a place where time feels frozen, offering a glimpse into deep geological time and a place where everything just feels a little strange. All right, before we start climbing up volcanoes, I wanna give a quick thank you to my pals over at Epidemic Sound for making this trip and this video possible. I just got done editing this one and it is packed with music and sound effects from Epidemic Sound. So if you're a longtime viewer here, you'll know that Epidemic Sound and I go way back. We've done several projects together and they've been my source for all of my sound effects for over five years now. Their library is huge, like over 90,000 sound effects huge, so no matter what I'm looking for, this is where I go. I use their sound effects to add atmosphere to my visuals, to give my graphics more character, and just to fill in all of those little detail sounds. I want this video to feel spacey and mysterious. I want you to feel the volcanoes rumbling, and sound is, how I can do that. They also have tons of great music, and one of my favorite features is that you can download the individual stems. So throughout this video, I'm constantly tweaking the individual stems of the music to make sure it lines up just right with what I'm showing you. And for the record, you won't get a copyright strike on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook. No matter where you're posting, they have you covered. All of the music in this video is from Epidemic Sound, so keep that in mind, and if you like what you hear, you can use the link in the description of this video to get a free trial of either a personal or commercial plan. And if you're watching this video when it goes live, they have a Cyber Week deal where you can get an extra two months of a personal plan for free by using that link. That offer is only available for the next five days, so be aware. It's thanks to sponsors like Epidemic Sound that I can go on these trips making these videos without going absolutely broke in the process. So thank you again, and now let's go check out some volcanoes. Look at this thing. And look at this lava flow in Arizona. It's so weird. About an hour or so before the sun really starts setting and the light gets really good. So, time to scurry up this thing. Volcanoes almost always form at tectonic plate boundaries, where spreading or warping of the Earth's crust allows magma to surface. Here in Arizona, we are nowhere near a tectonic plate boundary. The closest is the San Andreas Fault in California, more than 400 miles away. But somehow, here they are. This part of Arizona, for the most part, is a plateau. It's almost entirely flat. So just about every single hill or mountain you can see around here is a volcano, including this little hill that I'm standing on right now, and the one next to it, and the one next to it on the other side, all of them, all volcanoes. This area is a volcanic field a wide area containing a lot of volcanoes that are clearly related. It's been erupting for millions of years, and someday it'll erupt again. It covers 1,800 square miles and contains more than 600 volcanoes, so many that geologists stopped trying to give them all names and started using numbers instead. Almost all of them are cinder cones, small cartoony mountains usually less than 1,000 feet high with a prominent crater at the top. They're formed by a short eruption from a single volcanic event, the place where magma finally reaches the Earth's surface. Gas bubbles within the magma expand as they reach the surface, forming a lava fountain where lava shoots straight up out of the ground. It goes hundreds of feet into the air, and by the time it reaches the ground, the individual drops of lava have already cooled into these small rocks. As these cooled drops of lava rain down, they pile up around the vent and form that perfect symmetrical cone shape. So if you pay attention on the way up, you'll notice that these mountains are made entirely out of these little porous, lightweight rocks. These are the cinders 
that make up the cinder cone. So each of these is basically a drop of lava that cooled as it was falling back down to the ground and slowly built up this little volcano. And you look closely at them and you can see all these holes in them. And those are like the air bubbles that were in the lava helping it to cool more quickly. It's pretty cool. Many of the cones have lava flows, where lava managed to break through and ooze out during the eruption, some more obvious than others. Inside of the lava flows, you can find lava tubes. These form when the top of the lava flow exposed to the air cools and turns to rock. Having a rock roof insulates the lava underneath, keeping it hot so it keeps flowing through. Like how the top of a river ices over in the winter, but the water underneath keeps flowing. Eventually, the eruption stops and the lava drains out, leaving behind an empty cave. These can be complex networks of caves that branch out and intersect, and there are sometimes multiple layers from different lava flows stacking up on top of each other. We're in the desert of Arizona, but this place honestly feels like the Icelandic highlands. These perfectly symmetrical, like land before time style volcanoes, lava flows everywhere. It's like such an obviously volcanic landscape. It's fascinating. One volcanic feature here is much less obvious. From its exposed geology, scientists knew this mountain was volcanic, but they were confused by its weird non-volcanic shape. Rather than a prominent cone, it has this huge amphitheater opening out to one side. For decades, geologists only had loose theories. But on May 18, 1980, there was a breakthrough. I just saw an earthquake. Now we got a big slide coming off. Uh, now we've got an eruption down here. And we got another that opened up on the west side. The whole west side, northwest side is right down. We had a major eruption occurring at 8.32 approximately this morning on Mount St. Helens. It does appear that the northwest flank of the mountain seems to be gone. Emergency procedures have been put into effect. The way St. Helens erupted took scientists by surprise. The mountain erupted sideways, completely destroying its summit and blasting open a huge crater on one side of the volcano, with a lava dome starting to grow in the middle. Now, look at our volcano in Arizona again, and things start to make a lot more sense. You can even see the new lava dome. You can picture the mountain this once was, a pristine cone rising about 16,000 feet high. It would have been hard to take your eyes off of. There's one crater out here that actually isn't volcanic. It's 4,000 feet across, 600 feet deep, and formed about 50,000 years ago when a 150-foot-wide meteorite landed here, producing a shockwave that flattened forests up to 12 miles away and destroyed hundreds of square miles of land. People have lived among these volcanoes for over 5,000 years, growing crops in the rich volcanic soil, holding these mountains sacred, and witnessing at least a dozen eruptions. The most recent happened about 900 years ago, leaving behind this thousand foot tall cinder cone, three and a half square miles of lava flows, and 700 square miles of ash. It's estimated that a couple thousand people lived right nearby, forced to move a couple miles away as their homes were buried under falling cinders. Excavations have revealed perfect casts of corn frozen in cooled lava, which may have been thrown into the crater as it was erupting. Shortly after the eruption stopped, they moved back. Jump ahead about 800 years, and people continue to interact with this volcano, but differently. In the 1920s, Zane Grey's novels about the American West were killing, and many were being adapted into silent films. For an adaptation of his book titled Avalanche, they planned to simulate an actual avalanche by filling this volcano with dynamite and blowing it up. Local opposition stepped in and lobbied the federal government to protect the volcano, and it quickly became the national monument that it is today. A few decades later, the US was getting ready to go to the moon. They thought the moon was made of basalt, just like this volcanic field, and they recreated a lunar landscape here to train astronauts and test drive an early lunar rover. 
At the same time, a young artist in California was looking up at the same night sky, becoming obsessed with the cosmos, studying astronomy, and creating experimental art with light and space. The 2013 National Medal of Arts to James Terrell. In the 70s, he bought one of these volcanoes with the intent of turning it into kind of an observatory, kind of a big art installation. I'm not entirely sure, and his explanations don't really help. I'm interested in this landscape without horizon, up, no down, no left, or right. My desire is to bring astronomical events down into your personal lived-in space. I wanted to gather starlight that was from outside the planetary system, which would be older than our solar system. And you can gather that light and be and, and physically have that in place so it's physically present to feel. Yeah, these are geological formations that I really found perfect for that. In the 2010s, the project was running out of funding, and progress was nearing a halt. But in 2019, progress picked back up again, thanks to a huge donation from, dead serious, Kanye. The project has involved excavating over a million cubic meters of Earth to construct a network of tunnels and rooms within the volcano, and it's been criticized for its alteration of the landscape and its construction on indigenous land. All right, all of those are bizarre and fun side stories, but the question still remains. How did these volcanoes get here in the first place? Well, geologists have two main theories. These volcanoes sit in a rift zone, a place where the Earth's crust is stretching out. Between 25 and 40 million years ago, this area was near the coast, a tectonic plate boundary where the Phaleron plate in the ocean was sliding under the North American plate on land compressing the crust. About 12 million years ago, those plates calmed down and the crust started to stretch back out, thinning and forming cracks where magma could more easily surface, forming these volcanoes. But one clue points to something else. As you move from the southwestern end of the field to the northeast, the volcanoes get younger. That pattern suggests something called hotspot volcanism. Hotspots are not fully understood, and their origin is heavily debated. The theory is that they form over abnormally hot parts of the Earth's mantle. The hot magma rises up, melting the crust and breaking through to form volcanoes. The hot spot in the mantle doesn't move. Instead, the Earth's crust moves over it. Here in Arizona, the source of the volcanoes appears to be moving slowly northeast. But really, the North American tectonic plate has been slowly moving southwest. Hotspots are typically in the ocean, like Hawaii, forming chains of islands that will eventually sink back into the sea. Hotspots on land are much less common, but not unheard of, the most well known being Yellowstone. The theories are fascinating, but ultimately, we're just not sure. And still, so many more questions remain. Volcanic hotspots usually form large volcanoes at a few prominent vents. So why are these hundreds of small cinder cones instead? Why are hotspots on land so rare? And when will the next eruption happen? Being out here feels like looking back in time. The landscape feels both ancient and perfectly preserved frozen in time the way that it formed. It's honestly no surprise that the deserts of the Southwest have been the stage for so many stories of the strange and unexplainable. The landscape itself is often strange and unexplainable. Of course, that's changing, and our understanding of these volcanoes and their origin will almost certainly expand in the coming years and decades. But for now, there's something special about not knowing about looking out over a landscape made of hundreds of questions.